The Bob Murphy Show, episode 301. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm going to be speaking with Max Borders... Many of you may know him. Uh, just I'll read a little bit of his, his bio here, although he's he dabbles in a lot of things, but here's some of what he does. Max Borders is executive director of Social Evolution, a nonprofit startup dedicated to liberating people and solving social problems through innovation. Max is the author of After Collapse and The Social Singularity, and he also is a co-founder of the Future Frontiers Conference slash Festival. Okay, so what we're talking about today in this discussion is Max's concept of underthrow. Okay, and so this is something that it's intriguing, right? So he means in contrast to overthrow, right? So, you know, some revolutionaries might say, oh, we don't, you know, if you recognize the injustice of the current situation and the ruling elites, and we need to overthrow the existing structures and start afresh. And so Max is saying, no, no, history has shown us. That doesn't usually work out well. Instead of agitating to overthrow the regime, let's try to underthrow it. Okay? See how that works? So we basically just start talking about that and go into it. So the reason I kind of like this episode, I mean, I didn't kind of like it, I did like it, is we didn't have like 18 bullet points out and I just was hitting them and it was, it was, no, it was more. We really just started having a genuine conversation and just went wherever it took us. Okay? So... Uh, with that preface, here is my discussion with Max Borders. Max, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. I'm um, delighted to be here. So you've got a book out with a provocative title. Do you want to tell us what that is? Yeah, it's called Underthrow, How Jefferson's Dangerous Idea Will Spark a New Revolution. So can you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah, sure. So l first I'll start with um, Jefferson's dangerous idea and do it in reverse order. Okay. That that dangerous idea is, um, you know, a lot of people consider the Declaration of Independence to be something of a charter document for the country. It's not, of course, considered by the powers that be, because if it were, we'd have a lot more latitude to change things. And people really love and concentrate on the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you go down a couple of lines, there's all this business about revising or um, or getting rid of, of government and starting over. And that's based on this idea of the consent of the governed. And that idea of the consent of the governed really is the linchpin of both the idea that we that the American story really is about this notion of consent not the American dream and prosperity, all that stuff is secondary. Really, it's about being a, uh, a self-governing people. And I, in some sense, want to get back to our, help people, help readers get back to our liberal roots in that regard. Um, I am a philosopher, so I love abstractions. I love to meander. But one of the things that I find is that people resonate with the traditions from which they, they come. And so in appealing to this idea of consent, I'm able to question some of the things like the weaknesses of the current constitution that we have and the way it's interpreted and in some ways get away with what is otherwise a sacred text in the constitution. Um, now, this idea of underthrow is, um, is that with consensual relationships, say contractual relationships or agreements, we can, we can really um, do what is the opposite of overthrow, which is what the, the Jacobins did in the French Revolution. They overthrew power. Oh, oh, oh okay. I, yeah. I was wondering, because it was an odd term, but I, I get it now. So, yeah. as opposed yeah. so to... So we underthrow power yeah. through yeah. peaceful I got you. means. I got you. Yep. Yep. 
And that's uh, so that's the essence of it. So the underthrow uh, trope or line was was uh, devised by a friend of mine, a fellow uh, named Michael P. Gibson, who is a great writer and uh, hedge fund manager in his own right. Very creative guy, helped uh, launch people like Vitalik Buterin. But he but he had an, an article that he wrote way back in 2014 that was called the Nakamoto Consensus. And the idea of this would be that the line goes something like this, and I paraphrase, we will underthrow power one, one contract at a time. And so as we begin to think about cons consensual relationships and a body of law that's based on this notion of the consent of the governed, we can have both top-down and bottom-up conceptions of what a consensual order will look like. And that's, that's the through line of the book. Okay. Um, a few things to respond. I want to respond. So one thing is that you're, you're right with the Jefferson. It's funny how people, of course, oh, we love Thomas Jefferson. Declaration of Independence is great stuff. And yet I, I just had Daniel Miller on the, uh, the Human Action podcast that I do for the Mises Institute. And he's the head of the Texas Nationalist Movement. And there we were discussing how matter-of-factly people will say, oh, if, even if 70% of the Texans voted that they want us to leave the union, you know, that would be illegal. You can't do that. And it's <laughs> you know, just interesting that, you know, like that there's stances that when it's, you know, that's in the declaration, that's what the U S government lectures governments around the world. If any of their people want to break away, you know, typically yeah, the right of not, self -determination. Well, no, people don't have the right to self-determination. You get, you should, yeah, that's in the UN submission. charter. Yeah. And yet, it, it seems like America, like the one group nowadays that Americans don't in general think have the right to self-determination is other Americans. And sometimes right. they'll add on, because didn't the Civil War settle that? Because, you know, normally just mass slaughter decides, you know, whether people have the right to do something. <laughs> um, so, the, so there is that. Well, why don't I stop there? I mean, do you have any thoughts about, like, just to see, and again, whether it's in terms of secession or elsewhere, just that disconnect where Americans do seem to have a certain set of ideals, but yet... If it's applied to something domestically, they they seem to recoil from that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're I think you're absolutely right, and so is your guest at the over at the uh, the Human Action podcast. It sounds like um, that when you if you were to talk about the Basque Country, right, or you were to talk about the Catalans, or you were to talk about Scottish secession, mm -hmm. or any of these other, you know, if if it seems to be to people to be the product of some past imperialism or domination by some greater power, they're comfortable with it. Um, and yet, in my mind, the the right of self-determination is basically people in some jurisdiction saying, we we are being, uh, we are being, um, we are the products of imperialism and we don't want to be. So I, I don't think that, the, that that's a distinction without a difference. I'm, someone may argue with me on that, but of course, um, I, I do think that a right of secession, or if you like uh, the 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 less inflammatory UN language, right of self determination, I think that that is primary. And if you can instantiate that in law and have that law be respected, of course, the powerful aren't going to want that, and they're not going to let that happen. And that is a separate problem. Right. But in with with the process of underthrow, which um, I, I I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this example, but, you know, the, the old story of, of Gandhi is, is of leading his people to sort of bring down the British Raj in India. Mm -hmm. And the Indian independence movement was a product of, of underthrow. It was, peace, it was largely peaceful. I mean, it's not to say that people didn't get thrown in jail and that there weren't skirmishes, but, but on, on net, there was, um, there was a, a liberation movement, uh, a freedom movement in India, and that was able to be achieved. Now, what some people are will argue is that th that wasn't that wasn't really um, Gandhi's doing, nor was it the a, a species of underthrow as you have des described it. I think it is, um, at least in part. What they will say is that the British were basically uh, starting to lose control of their empire and going broke. And mm. particularly after the war, um, could no longer afford to control control an empire in the manner that they had before. And that is also true and can be true. 
But consider where the United States government is right now in terms of its unprecedented debt levels. We are we are going broke. We could be on the verge of collapse. I just keep looking at my watch, waiting for it to happen, as it did with Britain, as it has with all of these other great powers that went broke and started to try to inflate their way out of these problems. Is it going to happen in five years, 10 years, 20? I cannot say, but I can't help but think that it's going to happen. Yeah, I do too. And I, it's, uh, I, shoot, I forget that it, it's something like it, it's, it'll take longer to start than you think, but once it starts, it's going to be faster than you think. There's some aphorism like that, that I think is, is relevant to this situation too. Um, yeah, also people say things like it starts slowly, then quickly, you know, that kind of stuff, which I think is, is going mm -hmm. to be the case here. Like once, you know, some major power just announces we're divesting ourselves of us treasuries, it's going to be a fast unraveling. It's not going to be a, you know, a gentle thing, I think. Um, okay. So can you just, well, why don't we talk a little bit about that? Two ways of looking at a situation. Cause I've, I don't know if you know this, Matt, but or Max, <laughs> I know your name is Max. It just came out, Matt. Um, I, I have been a declared pacifist for years and, you know, I'll point to certain historical examples and then the people who are against pacifism can always, you know, so for example, you can point to Martin Luther King and then they'll say, oh yeah, but it was the radicalism of the Black Panthers that, you know, scared white America. And that's why they had the concessions. If it had just been, hey, peace and love and we're having marches and, you know, uh, firefighters hosing us down, that wouldn't have done anything. It was, you know, the threat that was behind it. And the same thing too, I've seen people talk about with Gandhi and that, oh yeah, there was that stuff, but then there were the other elements you know, threatening violence in the back. And so that's why the British ultimately, like the reason they couldn't afford to stay there wasn't just because Gandhi was, you know, leading marches and stuff, well, who cares, right? When it comes down to it, like the, the pain points are the things and maybe the other nonviolent rhetoric was good to, to win support for the cause, but ultimately the reason, well, you know, what the people running an empire respond to is, you know, destruction of their property or, or you know, violence to their soldiers or whatnot. So do you have any thoughts on on that? I mean, I first I, I'd, I'd say that I don't consider myself a pacifist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, although I admire pacifism, um, my mother would probably say you've got your your two testosterone addled to <laughs> to to be a pacifist um, or I have too much of my redneck father uh, blood in me, mm -hmm. but but I will say that I have come to terms with the idea of um, something like something akin to the Buddhist warrior monk, which is to practice ahimsa, nonviolence, in thought, word, and deed all the time. But a Buddhist warrior monk would go and 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 practice also martial arts uh, as as just as much as pra the practice of peace in mm -hmm. ahimsa. And so I tend to look at it as, as uh, not, not a strict binary, but as more of like pray for peace and prepare for war. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I hope that that war doesn't happen. And I think that, there, that it would, I don't know what the triggering event would be to where I would become something like a violent freedom fighter or something like that. Because I sure don't think that um, the things going on in the Middle East right now are... Um, uh, that, that, that tit for tat violence is, is the way, but I do think that, uh, but I, so what I try to do instead is focus on what I call subversive innovation as just nonviolent means of potential social change. And of course, one of the, the best, uh, so if you, if you think of it as a threefold mandate, subversive innovation for an economist, maybe you'll appreciate this. It's to, to the extent possible with your innovation, reduce transaction costs but also increase predation costs to make it more expensive for people to make you a, their prey. Mm -hmm. And finally, reduce exit costs. If you take those three um, together, that is the threefold mandate of, of subversive innovation. And so a great example of that, and I'm not sure if you're a fan of, of, of Bitcoin, but it, it, perhaps at oh, least yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Um, that you can, yeah, we can admire I mean, I don't just automatically say Bitcoin innovation. fixes this. For you know, in right. response to every social ill, but 
I yeah. do think Bitcoin does fix a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, the, the, I mean, and that's to me rather the point. It's like we continuously experiment. Mm -hmm. We introduce elements into this churn of creative destruction um, that that eventually some of these vectors of change will undermine these centralized sclerotic powers. And I think we're seeing evidence that the United States federal government, though behemoth, is teetering and, and, and sclerotic and therefore fragile. And so subversive innovators can um, can really do a lot of good through peaceful means, even if those means are hostile to the interests of the powerful. OK, yeah. So let me just throw out some examples and you tell me if this is like in line with what you're saying. So uh, I think probably the easiest one for Americans to understand is as an econ free market economist, you know, we've been writing stuff for decades about the uh, the licensure of uh, taxi cabs, you know, in major urban centers and how, oh yeah, these medallions, it's ridiculous. It restricts supply and blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't really resonate too much. The Whereas when Uber came out and Lyft and then the taxi cab unions tried to outlaw them saying, oh, this isn't safe. You know, we got to protect the passengers in our city. Everybody knew, no, this has nothing to do with customer safety. That's because they were undercutting you guys and you want to protect your monopoly. Like, so, I mean, that really made the point where as, you know, essays or so just the fact that it was implemented and, you know, it was made real like that all of a sudden, I think everyone understood that, oh yeah, this, this can work. We don't need the government out there, you know, telling us who it's safe to get in whose vehicle that, you know, the market can figure that out. Um, the late Nelson Nash, um, he, he had developed a way, Max, to use life insurance to manage cash flows. It was like a financial system. And so he would when he encountered me, you know, originally, and, and I was going around with Austrians talking about like, end the fed and stuff. And his point was like, yes, that's great. But in the meantime, let's give people tools that they can kind of, you know, reduce their exposure on their own. And, and his, the analogy he used, he said, there the post office had a monopoly and then, you know, UPS and FedEx and these other things just arose to sense of privately. It's not that we had to first lobby and shut down the post office politically, because that would have been hard to do. So that, you know, the way is just things to sprout up to allow people in the, you know, tomorrow to start uh, limiting their vulnerability to this state system. And yeah, you can still tell people that, hey, in a perfect world, this thing wouldn't exist. But rather than like putting your hopes in, okay, first we got to elect politicians, then they're going to go and then they're going to pass legislation. And maybe 30 years from now, we can have freedom. Like that's kind of a crazy thing to do. Uh, uh, I mean, beautifully said. I mean, I... I, I call it the three P's. There are three little boxes that we cramp we cramp ourselves into. Uh, one one of the three, sometimes multiples, but uh, politics, policy, and punditry. And those mm -hmm. three P's are about as useful as uh, you know, uh, throwing pebbles at the side of a great barn, you know, or voting, you know, crying your teardrop in the ocean and expecting the tide to turn, and wondering why it never does it's like guys we're not gonna we're not gonna vote our way to shangri-la and um so i you know while i appreciate i i, I appreciate the people who are you know these think tanks and so on i've been involved in them for many years um there were uh, probably i'd say you know 10 or 15 years ago i had a, a, a pretty big turn in in my way of thinking which is away from the three p's which is away from this uh, politics and policy approach to matters. I still do the punditry because I because I love it and I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but in terms of but I but I see my punditry as more as a vector for getting to people to leave the three P's and go into creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Um, and and I as I understand it, Bob, you have uh, some sort of business that you where you work with this Nash style effort. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I was part of the formation of what was called the Nelson Nash Institute. I've since moved yeah. to this organization called Infinio, where yeah, we're t using blockchain technology and whole life insurance and coming yeah. up with you know putting real world assets on the blockchain, that kind of stuff. So yes, and that's what we're. It, it's it's ironic, Max, because it really does dovetail. Somebody just I want to say within the last forty eight hours tweeted at me saying. You know, Bob, how do we get out from under the thumb of the Federal Reserve System? And I said, I think, you know, what I what I think the best use of my time is to help build alternatives for people rather than 
you know, I've written books and things, given lots of lectures, and explaining damn good ones. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. You know, yeah. laying out the theory and yes, it would be, you know, the Fed causes the business cycle, blah, 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 the basis of the currency. But at the end of the day, you know, it's there's a lot of powerful interest supporting it. And I thought, OK, I've made the intellectual case and now I'm going to go, you know, do other things to try to build tools for, you know, what can you do in the meantime while the Fed still exists? Exactly. I mean, I've got this uh, this Swedish buddy who he's like a crazy Viking. He came to came to visit down the East Coast in the States and I'm moved away from Austin and I'm now living mm. in South Carolina. And he came through. I got to meet him for the first time in person. But he's this crazy Swedish philosopher. He's he's really interesting guy. And one of the thing, one of the he, he has these two archetypes that he has articulated, which he calls pillar saints and boy pharaohs and the the basic idea behind the pillar saint is they're they're basically autist activists it's all about what comes out of my brain and my opinions that you're trying to sort of broadcast to, to get people to change um an exemplar would be greta thunberg you know mm -hmm. or, or 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 your or your average uh, ivory tower intellectual at a university you know basically useless in terms of instantiating anything in the world that that makes a beautiful dent of any sort right they're all abstractions whereas the the boy pharaoh has no head has no none of these abstractions and is really just about throwing his weight around you know it's, it's just a uh, someone who who seeks power for its own sake and wants to show what a tough guy he is or she is for that matter because these are mm -hmm. archetypes that can be in both sexes and you know, sometimes what we see and that and a good example of that would be uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor, governor of California. Mm -hmm. But when these two get together, they function like boot, bootleggers and Baptists, you know, Bruce right, Yandel's okay. old conception. Mm -hmm. And so we get, um, you know, horrible policy coming out of Sacramento that's been devastating to the state. Um, and it's all connected in some sense to these abstractions of these pillar saints, as he calls them. And I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't want to, I, I know you're a man of faith, so I don't want to, um, you get the idea though. Oh yeah. Cause yeah. pillar saints were a specific kind of, uh, the disembodied in, in, in a lot of ways they are not, they, they don't, they don't live in their bodies and in themselves. They just, they're, they live in abstraction land. It's a metaphor. So anyway, I have found that the, the politics policy and punditry crowd really are kind of too close to the pillar saint domain, mm -hmm. particularly as the policy analysts tend to just throw their white papers over the moat and hope that somebody in the federal government picks it up and goes, oh, this is a great idea. We'll just implement this without any regard to the dynamics of public choice and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So I just gave up on that universe years ago. And while I love all of your thinking and writing and your awesome Austrian economics, I am also really glad to see that you're trying that you are doing something to to really um, align your head, heart and gut in such a way that will actually make something happen in the world. And that's that's really the essence of subversive innovation. I, I try to bring that as a as a through line in all my work. Well, yeah, this is great stuff. Uh, a quick anecdote. So I think I've said this a few times in various podcasts, but uh, so folks, forgive me if this is the third time you've heard it, but. What was really instrumental, uh, Max, in terms of just making me see the, I mean, futility is a strong word, but how hard it was going to be to just send the right people, you know, up to Washington and blah, 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 is I wrote something for a California-based think tank about um, taking California's state income tax and making it a flat tax. And I went through, and I was just using standard literature and blah, 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 come up with estimates. And, you know, and the, and the, the mandate I had was to make it revenue neutral. And so I'm going through and, and it, it was a, uh, so I, I got the rate down pretty low. Like the p other people at the think tank were pleasantly surprised. And so that, you know, it was good marketing and da, 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 da. And a, uh, somebody, a Republican who was freshly elected at the state level over there, he read the, the paper and loved it flew me out there. I think I was living in Nashville at the time, flew me out there. I met with the guy, his chief of staff was sitting there. So it was just the three of us in his office. And, and I, he, he really got it. You know, he wasn't like just some glad handler, you know, 
hey, tax cuts. Well, hey. like, no, he really understood like some of the subtleties in the analysis. Sharp guy. He, he wanted to push it in. You know, so the, he and I are talking for a bit. And then a little bit later, his chief of staff chimes in and he basically said, uh, sir, there's no point in you pushing this. The Repu other Republicans won't even get this won't even get out of committee if you push this. And it will just, you know, then when you go up for re-election, you know, your Democratic opponent is just going to hang this over your head about this radical giveaway to the rich that you supported that didn't. Do so he, he just basically said, there's no point to this. This is only going to hurt you. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to get anywhere if you introduce this. And it's just going to be a liability. And by the end of the meeting, the guy like shook my hands. Okay, thanks, Dr. Murphy. We'll be in touch. And I knew walking out of there, I was never going to hear from him again. I never did. And the thing is, when I tell people that story, they say, oh, I bet you're really mad at that chief. And I was like, no, he was what he was telling him was the truth. That was good advice to his boss, like politically, you know. And so that's when I realized, like, oh, even if you do find people who are, you know, hungry and they're passionate and they want to go do the right thing, the system is designed just to snuff that out. Yeah, it's it's and I don't know whether you'd say it's designed or evolved, but it's certainly it is certainly hostile to good ideas. Mm -hmm. I remember um, back in the mid, the mid noughts, I guess, mid to late noughts, I was studying with uh, what at the time was the Koch Associates program with the, you know, the Kokies, mm -hmm. the um, Charles Koch's foundation. They had mm -hmm. a program for young, young folks. And I wasn't particularly young at the time, but I guess I was a late bloomer. And I remember learning about this idea, this, this analogous structure of production idea um which was, was really bizarre to me um and thinking about it in hindsight for for a number of reasons but the idea is that um it, it analogous to high structure production which is about physical you know goods moving from moving from you know like iron ore in the earth to consumption goods through this process structure production which you i'm sure know very well then you have they 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 sort of tried to turn it into a thing about ideas where you would have mm -hmm. at the universities you would have these ideas that will be, would be percolating at this tippy top of the structure of production and then eventually move down into the the policy analysts and think tanks which would eventually get to the lobbyists and to the politicians mm -hmm. um yeah i've seen that diagram or presentation yep yeah and i i mean i remember thinking at the time and and of course you know, the, the ideas we've been talking about, something like Uber or something um, something like Bitcoin, um, it's, it's really not these kind of these really interesting entrepreneurial or innovative efforts in social change almost never happen through this linear hierarchical process. It's almost through a series of networks and experimentations and concatenations and information flows within networks of within knowledge networks uh, it, it, over the extended order. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at the, these processes through an entrepreneurial lens, um, there's still something for Austrian economics to contribute to that lens or to, to, for us to, to reckon with that approach, but it ain't the structure of production, I'm afraid. So I, I, I think that was another thing that that i was i was disabused of sort of those kind of notions as well um and so when i see people who are like yeah i'm gonna go work in washington dc these young pups these upstarts you know they they just want to go be in dc and they move there and they clean up and you know mm -hmm. put on their little suit and they make thirty five thousand dollars a year and they're they're just okay with that thinking that they're going to make social change and slowly but surely like the politicians they serve or the special interests they serve, they sell off little pieces of their soul until they have no principles anymore. And we get what we have, which is a rotten Republic, mm -hmm. an empire rather. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you certainly don't have to dip your toe in this max if you don't want to. Um, but I, what you reminded me when you're talking about how you were working with the, in the Coke associates program and, they had like the intellectual structure of ideas and such. Um, to me, I, those two competing visions, I think, as people know, there's like a big rift among self-identified Austrian economists 
I'm speaking loosely here, but like there's the the Auburn, Alabama, Mises Institute wing, and then there's the, like the George Mason, you know, Fairfax, Virginia, DC orbit kind of wing. And each have their, I can see where, and by the way, I've like worked in both camps and, you know, some would say, oh, it's because I'm very diplomatic and a friendly guy. Others would say, because I have no principles and I just am a fence sitter. Who knows? You know, it's up to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, uh, so I'm just saying, like, I have friends and I, I know both realms and I understand yeah. why each thinks they chose the best, right? That the mm -hmm. GM, they're like, are you kidding me? We, you know, look at every couple of years, we have an, an Austrian, a self-identified Austrian teaching at a more highly ranked university. And we've got this 50 year plan and we're going to get students in place. And, and then eventually we're going to have Austrians at MIT and Harvard. It's just, you got to do the work. You know, you can't just say, oh, they're all corrupt. You got to go publish in mainstream journals and da, 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 and what, you know, uh, make sure you, you do the rankings and don't go just write a bunch of articles for the quarterly journal of Austrian economics. That looks, makes you look crankish and whatever. You got to go do the work. And, you know, if we're better economists, then, you know, the truth will out. Whereas like the people with the Mises Institute, but and by the way, many of them are, you know, tenured college professors at good universities. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a complete dichotomy, but the, the attitude there is like, who did Murray Rothbard, you know, Rothbard was not trying to get published in the AER. He was writing for the common people, like to let them know that, you know, don't let these, uh, you know, politicians bamboozle you and all of their, the charlatan witch doctors that they trot out who have Nobel prizes in economics. And yet what they're spouting is nonsense, right? So you have the, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, the, the people who are thinking, oh, th that's a, a lose the academia, that's a rigged game that there it's kind of silly to play on those terms that this is, you know, you know, goofy. So anyway, I don't, like I said, you, I don't, you don't have to stick your neck out and get vitriol from one side or the other, but do you have any thoughts on that general sort of, and they each have disdain for the other, like the one like, Oh yeah, you guys are really good on the internet. You got like, there's a term internet Austrians that yeah. the GMU crowd <laughs> uses to disparage like, Oh yeah, you went and read Rothbard. You don't know anything about money and banking. Did you, have you read Selgin? You know, and then, of course, the other people will say stuff like, oh, getting your cocktail parties in Washington and, you know, rubbing elbows with a senator, but you, uh, you know, don't have any principles. So anyway. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I sort of look back sort of like a, an amused cat on the back of the couch at these, these, kind, of, <laughs> these kind of wars. Um, and it's not to say I don't appreciate uh, people on uh, across these organizations and their ideas. I certainly do. Um, but I, I tend to think, what are you doing? What are you actually getting done? Mm -hmm. And I, and I apply that question to myself because I have a very, you know, I, I can easily go into pillar saint land, uh, which is to say, you know, abstraction land, you know, punditry and philosophy and all this sort of stuff. So I'm constantly challenging myself to um, to try to break out of that and be an embodied mind, if you if you like. Um, so, you know, one of the things that so f I'll give you a couple of examples of things I do like, uh, you know, um, there's a little uh, these little micro scholarships fund that uh, I think Tyler Cowen does through uh, through Mercatus, perhaps that is invest in these little interesting ventures or mm -hmm. people, you know, I don't think that they're, they're necess necessarily all, always incorporated or anything like that. It's more, it's like, this is a promising person doing a promising thing. Well, let's, let's, let's support that and see where it goes. So it's, it's just like placing little bets on things that have potential to uh, make a massive impact. And of course you're going to get, you're probably not even going to get a Pareto, aspect out of this, which, it, you know, would be, you know, 20% responsible for most of the, the impact. It's probably even smaller, something more like the startup landscape. Yet I appreciate that. And I would like to see more of this fusion between the, the sort of unicorn hunter VC space of, of Silicon Valley, which is also a little in its own way, has its own pathologies. I think you would probably agree. Not, not, not merely that, um, you know, they, well, anyway, 
I, I think your listeners will probably agree Silicon Valley has its own pathologies and mm-hmm. we could go down a huge rabbit trail on that. Suffice it to say, though, they have picked some interesting winners in this world and uh, created value on net. They've done some very destructive things, too. But I think value has been created on net in Silicon Valley. And that iterative set of investments staged to scale um, is interesting. I would like to see more of this kind of fusion between the intellectuals and the intellectual class, whether that even be something as simple as like Robin Hanson's betting, betting markets ideas, yeah. you know, um, or I don't know if that's Hanson's. I mean, he's had variations on it Two GMU guys. Right. But then there, you know, there are people who uh, come out of these other traditions or these other um, institutes and in, in various places who are also doing interesting things. Um, I think, for example, I would I would say, uh, forgive me for butchering his name, Saifedean Amos, uh, the the Austrian economist who wrote the Bitcoin Standard, is doing a lot to doing tremendous work in being a Bitcoin a Bitcoin evangelist mm-hmm. and helping people understand the pathologies of the fiat system, for example, with the fiat standard and and mm-hmm. so his many books. So even if you're an intellectual and you can you can go from the realms of abstraction and the you know the journal industrial complex, which is just a sort of a circular kind of onanism among an, in, intellectual elites and how they keep their their cartel, their, you know, mm-hmm. their moneyed cartel uh, alive, uh, to someone who's really good at outreach, someone like you, you're doing it right now, I think. This is the kind of stuff that helps, you know, helps us get out of this, because I do think to some degree, degree this idea that the, these GMU professors are going to mint more GMU professors who are going to mint more GMU professors are going to eventually occupy some little side over here at Harvard. Who gives a <laughs> Like at the end of the day, show me the returns, self-propagating professor network, professor hierarchies are not doing the work. That's not really doing actual work in the world as in changing it in an appreciable way. Now I'm sure they're going to have some, well, we have examples of this, but, and maybe they do, but I'm, I'm not, um, I'm more interested in what people are working on that are going to have an impact. So for example, um, one last example, um, there's a fellow from, I think it was Washington university who was had very deep Austrian sensibilities and did did um, legal theory, but he was also a computer scientist. His name is Nick Shabo. He's one of the progenitors of the Bitcoin protocol, if not one of the Satoshis or or Satoshi. So that's cool stuff. You know, if your white paper c- can move the needle, excellent. If your white paper is going to, you know burnish your laurels or whatever who cares Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i don't know if this is going along with what you're saying or is orthogonal to it but i noticed um in the class of like online uh people with let's call them shows or maybe public intellectual there's no no, that's not what i want to say the people who are gaining market share in terms of being personalities out there discussing big ideas where I've noticed there's more and more PhDs going in there, you know, like, like Tom Woods has a big show. He, you know, he's got a PhD, uh, you know, he went to Harvard undergrad, you know, he's, he's a, you know, well, uh, credentialed academic. Um, you know, I happen to, I don't have as big a show as Tom does, but you know, I'm doing my thing. Uh, a huge guy, you know, Jordan Peterson, James Lindsay, you know, are real big in their respective spheres. And, you know, so mm. I've just, I've noticed that there, there is this thing where, um, you know, the, the, it's people are like opening up this avenue where, yeah, yeah the route, what I'm re- responding to, Mac, is how you were saying, it's not that you're against people being educated and being intellectual. You're just like saying, like, what are they doing with that? Yeah, because there, I think there's a real risk of um, to sort of to protect, you know, we have a 
deep sort of security instinct and this risk aversion that people can have when they when they have this when they operate in sort of the co cottony confines of the academy that's going to make it such that you're not going to be as effective because you're going to do the thing that the incentive system of the guild tells you to do, which is publish or perish. And so um, the, I think there's two reasons uh, that, that we're starting to see a sea change in this regard. One is like you say um, that, that they're true believers in some sense, and they want to get the word out and they want to be, um, evangelists for, for ideas that can make actual social change. But another is that there is a real hostility uh, to, to anything that goes against the intellectual monoculture of higher education, which is essentially become social justice fundamentalism. And the best you can do at most universities now is stay quiet about anything that has to do with social justice and hope it doesn't come to your department. Otherwise, you play nice and, you know, you, you, you genuflect before the BLM stuff and you put a little black square there and you what, whatever the cause du jour is. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's how social justice fundamentalism has been able to penetrate to such a degree these universities to now we're we're getting kids calling for genocide and stuff like that and accusing others of being genocidal, which is pretty pretty classic uh, Marxist tactic, but I don't want to sound like James Lindsay. I think he's doing that job. You know what I mean? He's, uh, he's one of the examples you gave He's a mathematician who turned into uh, someone who got really tuned in to post postmodern postmodernism and critical theory and see how it's sort of being integrated into the world. And I am, I have to say, I admit, there is something to be admired about that. I remember in 1993, when I was at, in an undergrad, my first year or second year of college, I was treated to the first wave, which was called at the time political correctness. I'm mm -hmm. sure you remember. Yep. All of these same ideas were being taught. I remember learning uh, Herbert Marcuse, Franz Fernon. I mean, all of it. All of the kind of stuff that James Lindsay talks about now. Now, I happen to be a good old, I just had been baptized in Ayn Rand <laughs> so at the time. Mm. So I had, uh, um, I had a, a good immune system, even though I don't consider Randian uh, philosophy to be, you know, it's not my philosophy. And I, I feel mm. like I graduated from that in some respects, although I have major, major respect for the, the effect that she had on my life. You had to get including subsequent that. booster shots, but that was a good inoculation at the beginning. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, so, but though, but though that first, those first years of political correctness, it was all the same stuff. And seeing the success in the, however many 30 years since, has it been that long? Goodness. Yeah. Uh, seeing the success of, of radical social justice or social justice fundamentalism, what people call wokeism since then. Really is just as how this stuff infects the minds of people and, and it sort of spreads out into ne human networks mm -hmm. is really interesting. We must be able to admire the mimetic features of it. Um, even if we loathe the, the mind virus itself right, and what it right. does to people turns them into non-reflective zombies and activists, but how it was able to catch fire. I think there's something to be learned from that for good old fashioned liberals like us. What? Well, okay. So let me then say like a, like Pete Becky or somebody is going to say, Max, what are you talking about? That's exactly what we were trying to do. And yet you and Bob 15 minutes ago were, you know, casting aspersions on the intellectual structure of ideas. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Win back these beachheads, the, the, you know, the, the Marxist had this grand plan, you know, dating back decades of conquering all the institutions, the March to the institutions, and they pulled it off beautifully 
And so we're just trying to win them back. And, and, not, and you're saying that's, that's not a, you know, that's a losing strategy. What's going on? Well, it, th that has certainly occurred to me. And I think to some extent that that response is not wrong. Although I will say the way the structure of social change, as it was called, was presented to me was very specific uh, trajectory from mm -hmm. academia, which was at the top of the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. Down to um, down to specifically to policy shops, down specifically to um, lobbyists and then to politicians who would then pass laws. So it was, it was a very specific path. And I think what's interesting about, um, while I think, uh, while there are some similarities depending on how you look at it, and I want to acknowledge that fully, I think there are distinct differences. And one of those is that, um, Yes, there were academics at the top at, at the center of these networks, but they didn't go for try to go into the in, necessarily into the environments, a specific environments of policy shops to eventually make legislation. Right. It it was much more about changing hearts and minds until you had armies of zombies. And this happened in much more diffuse networks. So yes, I think they started with a, th a similar theory, which is to say, we got to take over the education departments and then the education departments are going to take over the, the public schools and then the public mm -hmm. schools are going to start to, and you're going to get these ideas radiating out into the young. And finally, mm -hmm. here comes TikTok, boom. Mm -hmm. And it's it spreads like wildfire. No doubt, social media, but that is those, and then you get people who see the power of these networks and see, and hear the ho the hostile voices of the activists, or and feel the legacy of guilt, intergenerational guilt for whatever intersectional victim there is, and you start to see this sort of deference to these powerful networks. So you do start seeing um, maybe here and there some legislation like defund the police or whatever which I have some agreement with, not defund the police, uh, you know, simpliciter, but rather let's, let's reconfigure the police. Let's start realigning their incentive. Let's start, let's do police reform. And yet we don't want to get rid of police and we don't want to get rid of a criminal, criminal justice system. Um, or we're going to get the kind of garbage that we have today, which is that our major cities are either covered in excrement or burning down. Neither of these things is good. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, but going back to your question, your response to them, I was like, I don't think the hierarchical sort of like Pete Becky, um, you know, let's, let's just keep churning out many, many Pete's who are going to eventually write white papers who are going to eventually go to your, your, uh, your legislator in California and get sent packing because that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens uh, most of the time. And I, so I, I just don't think that that, that stiff set of pathways is going to work. I think it it can happen much more in the ma mode and manner of what Matt Ridley would call ideas having sex, where it's bouncing around in information networks by people who are both intellectuals and entrepreneurs, and they're piecing individual bits together and trying experiments that could mass gain massive constituency groups very soon in the manner of Bitcoin or Uber. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm looking at the clock here. Unfortunately, I have nine minutes and I have a hard stop. So let me, this, this does dovetail into, I know another topic that you like to speak on, which is related is you think there's the opportunity for another great awakening. And so again, it's, it's, it's can you expand on that? And, but also because like, I've heard some people say like, oh, forget ideology, stop trying to persuade people, just build, you know, encryption Go, You know, if, if the, uh, Patrick Friedman's Seastead project takes off. That's exactly the kind of thing we need. Uh, you know, let people go off grid, just give people tools so they can go implement freedom. You know, ultimately if we could have everyone get like a force shield around them so that, you know, the IRS agents couldn't touch you, that would be the best thing. But you know, so you don't, you don't need to persuade people about Liberty, just give them tools. But when you're talking about the great awakening, that seems like you're, you're not going to that extreme either. 
No. And, and, um, I have to say that while I am very steeped in that, that whole world, mm -hmm. it's the Balaji Srinivasan network state or Patri Friedman seasteading. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, I was in a, one of the original writers of white, seasteading white papers. And yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love that stuff. I love this idea of exit. You know, I said one of the third, you know, the third mandate of, of subversive innovation is to, is to reduce costs of exit mm -hmm. and, and by implication, um, you know, introduce opportunities to enter new systems entrepreneurially. So, you know, therefore we come full circle that, that is, you know, innovations are, uh, every innovation in some sense is an act of subversion is, is the way I put it, but no, I have, I definitely think we need, um, something that integrates, um, the moral teachings of the faith traditions, which are shared among them, at least the healthier faith tradi traditions. Um, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go straight to Islam because I'm having a hard time with Islam lately, you know, because of what's happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I see a lot of Islamic fundamentalism on display, but I know that there are features of Islam as a doctrine that we can pick out and say, that's good. One is zakat. This idea that you, it's similar to tithing in Christianity, right? It's the idea that you set aside and that there's social pressure and communitarian aspect of setting aside some of your wealth and income to improve the life of someone else, right? Mm -hmm. That to me is the kind of voluntary, it's not to say that there's no social pressure on you, but that is one of the sort of the institutional constructs of, 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 of religious doctrine and faith that is, I think, a beautiful aspect of Islam. I am getting married to a lovely Jewish woman, so I'm learning a lot about that, you know, uh, learning about the Jewish faith tradition as well. Mm -hmm. And I see so much that is beautiful and handy about, as, particularly in the, uh, not, and not just in the Abra Abrahamic traditions, but also in, in the Eastern traditions. Earlier, I mentioned Ahimsa, this idea of nonviolence is a practice and thought word indeed. And it, it does tells very nicely. And in fact, overlaps considerably with the golden rule. These timeless emergent um, systems of morality and culture that I would call good, you know, the true, the beautiful and the good, we can't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. And even if not, I'm not a devout Catholic like you, I think are a Catholic, right? I was raised Catholic. I'm Protestant. You're, okay. Now. Oh, you're a Protestant. Okay. Well, as a, as a Protestant, you know, I might, um, I might not uh, share that faith tradition, but I see the importance of faith traditions because I do think, and I've been a long, I was a long time an atheist. Now I consider myself a very questioning agnostic, um, who is deeply interested in, in the, in religion and in the idea of God. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm on a very strange part of my faith journey and I won't go too deeply into that because your listeners are already bored by this, I'm sure. But I will say that there is a, there is a feature of moral teaching and cultural binding with the invisible filaments of community that has been lost as we have abandoned our faith traditions, which means we have abandoned what was le left of our communities because we outsourced our responsibilities to the welfare warfare state mm -hmm. and gave up our faith and therefore gave up our religious communities, which were the last communities after the dissolution of the mutual aid societies, which were so strong and so, so abundant at the turn of the 20, uh, 19th and 20th century. And prior to that, the friendly societies, mm -hmm. the loss of that great empire of good meant that we lost something in moral practice in a culture of good and constantly inculcating and and sharing in being good to each other rather than outsourcing that to distant capitals we lost the practice and in so doing i see it, even if i don't agree with specific doctrine in a in a particular tradition i say on net people need to get their asses back to church temple mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you familiar, Max, with um, the ARC, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship? 
Do you know what that is? Is that the okay. new? Uh, it's uh, is Jordan that the new Peterson's thing. Jordan Peterson's thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I, and I, it's more than just him, but that's that was my end to it. That yeah, he you know, hey, there's the World Economic Forum, the people interested in a free society, we should have our thing. So I went to their inaugural session that happened. Oh, in London. Month. Yeah. So I was yeah, cool, I was cool. there, and it, it there was things I liked and things I didn't like about it, but. Yeah, one of the themes that especially Jordan was talking about and some of the other participants was saying we need to give like the young people a better story. Like in other words, he was saying like we, we have the facts on our side of it, but the left or whatever you want to call the progressives, whatever, the Marxists, they're you know, they tell such a compelling story and they bring people in that way and they feel like they're in this adventure. Whereas if we're just like, oh, capitalism is more efficient than socialism, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah, that's we're not all capturing logos. the hearts and minds. Yeah, yeah, we're so, all logos, no pathos and mythos. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's one way of putting it. Sure. So, okay, so do you want to? I mean, yeah. One thing is, if you haven't looked, you, you might want to just go check and see like some of their the videos of some of their. You know, they put a lot of the stuff online from that. Some of it might resonate with you because it does seem a lot of the speakers there were grappling with it. it sounded similar to what you were just saying, you know, saying now that we're in a secular age, like this is partly what we lost. And, you know, that kind of goes to that famous Nietzsche quote about God is dead where, you know, people think he was like saying, ha ha, we got rid of the stupid guy. And that's not what he was saying. He was saying, now that we've removed this from Western society, things are going to start happening because, you know, there were certain foundations there that, you know, anyway. Yeah. I mean, if do I, do I have one minute? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. You okay. Got f let's say four. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, cool. Um, uh -huh. No, I um, I am a practitioner or an adherent. I don't know what you call it uh, of what uh, in what is called integral theory or stage theory in the philosophy of Ken Wilber, but also um, in less in less uh, philosophical terms, stage theories of um, psychosocial development. Right. Um, Robert Keegan is one of the one of that at Harvard, but the idea is uh, as we as we develop and age and gains wisdom and experience and so on, more or less. I'm I'm breaking it down in simple terms. We 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 sort of ascend through stages of development, and that these can can take on cultural social cultural hues. Um. And this tracks this idea of tracking with complexity through time as we have changed. So, um, you know, the, 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 the one I like in particular is because the first one I encountered and I know it best is called spiral dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage folks to look up spiral dynamics and they can, you can see an image of this upward spiral. But the idea is that you move through these stages of development. So you have the traditionalists, uh, you, you have the, you have the survival band, which is just like, I got to eat, I got to provide for myself. Then, then you have the clan uh, stratum, which is like uh, what people do together, a small sub Clan with group. a C, not a K, just to be clear. That's right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> please. Um, and so clan groups, you know, the dynamics of a clan group and hunter-gatherer so societies and so on like that. So this is roughly tracking with history too. Then they moved into the sort of uh, egoistic dominating uh, ethos, which was, you know, the, the, the beginnings of imperial domination. When you start competing as clan groups for resources, then the strongest tend to prevail. And you get these, you know, we're going to dominate theirs, take their stuff, rape their women, and it's going to be ours. And imperial ambition sort of spread out from there. But you see the excesses in each of these phases. And so you start to make changes. And from so from that one, you make a change to um, to a, tr a traditionalist a sort of ordered universe under God, um, you know, which is the, the faith traditions uh, uh, that we are familiar with currently. You know, they still occupy. Mm -hmm. And then you from that, you get a science and commercial. So with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, you start to get a commercial and scientific stratum that gets built on that. And but the industrial revolution led to so many excesses and things. So you get the you get the next level, which is um, one that is more egalitarian, one is more environmental, and so on. And then you get to uh, a quantum leap to to two tiers above that, which suffice it to say, without taking too much of this dwindling four minutes, is very Hayekian in its orientation. It's about uh, emergence and um, 
and starting to see things in terms of holes and parts and things like that. And it's a very different way of looking at the world. It's hard to, and so my belief is that the, or my, my thinking is that the woke social justice movement in, in, neo, in Marxism and neo-Marxism is, is as a response to that, that what is known as the orange phase that scientific mm -hmm. commercial phase and its excesses. Mm -hmm. And it's butting up against going into the second tier, right? The green one is the egalitarian environmentalist one has its healthy things, you know, consensus, uh, notions of equality and so on like that. But it starts to get in unhealthy pathologies coming to the fore. And we're seeing that now writ large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to find entryways into this second tier one, you know, the, the first of the second tier is yellow. And so I try to contextualize my own thinking in my own entrepreneurial means as ways of getting people to go to yellow in, in terms of not just in terms of, you know, subversive innovation, which is also true. And I've been singing those singing that song uh, for in this show, but also in terms of the moral cultural dimension, I'm trying to get people to start to one of the markers of this phase is not to to be so dogmatic about any one of these and wear it like a, like a Randian would be just like all orange, you know, in a, right, right. in a, in a traditionalist Christian would be all blue. And then a, you know, social justice warrior would be all green and they're at war with each other, but instead start to see the healthiest aspects of each, each and integrate them in interesting and beautiful ways and in experimental ways, how you build a story on that out of that, is really freaking hard. I'm trying to figure out how to do it, but with a nod to the ARC folks, I think it's necessary. You know, I mentioned just a minute ago the idea of um, logos, which all, most libertarians are nothing but logos to, to almost autistic degrees. But we have to consider pathos, emotional resonance, right? Our hearts. We have to consider mythos, the stories, and we have to consider ethos, our relationship our moral relationships to others in our communities all of these features these ancient vectors of of persuasion and understanding and making change in the world are holistic and we have to continue to see them as a piece as a as a single entity that we employ in various respects if we don't we're never going to get anywhere that's why nobody listens to libertarians we're all logos Okay. Well, as a Christian, of course, I'm a big fan of the logos, but <laughs> I know the sense in which you're, you're meaning it. You yeah. Know, and I, I, I forgot about yeah. that sense too. Yeah. <laughs> um, just actually just to avoid confusion for people. So you, yeah, I just mean there, reason, you, the use of reason. And yes. Yeah. Right. Logic. Yeah. So you don't mean the word of God. Um, okay. Right. So Max, can you tell people, you know, again, remind them what the book is and then where do they go to see more of your stuff? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, my book is called my latest book is called Underthrow. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Just search Underthrow, opposite of Overthrow. And my name is Max Borders, M A X B O R D E R S. You can also go to Underthrow.org. I do my very best to publish every weekday, uh, sometimes recycled material, sometimes new. But you can find a lot of my work there, and I'd love to have you as part of that community. Well, great. So thanks, Max. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. See you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.